is actually, I noticed, an anti-austerity seminar, and I really am tempted that we should spend the whole time talking about Neil Ferguson's absolutely lying piece, which I'm sure you've read in the Financial Times, but really someone should take it apart. But having said that, I'll move on to against happiness. So here are a few quotations just to show you the very different ways people have um, looked at this topic. Um, I like Karl Marx, and then there's very different Henry David Thoreau, and so on. So it's just, uh, you can see very many deep thinkers have thought about it in very different ways. Now, I'm not, of course, against people being happy, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm against using a measure of happiness as the sole or main criterion for deciding whether societies are making progress <coughs> in development or not. And that's really what I'm, the, the topic today. And the reason I'm bringing it forward is that some people are increasingly saying, forget about GNP, with which I'm, I'm quite happy, as you will see, but also forget about human rights, just look and see whether people are happy. And I don't think that this is good way of assessing progress. I'm not getting it to move. Oh, that's good. All right, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, talk about who says happiness should be the main objective and why they're saying it. And then I'm going to move on to talk about problems in measurement, in distributional issues, in definition, I'll then consider a few other goals and try and compare them. And finally, I'm going to consider that, given my conclusion that I don't like happiness as a, the main criterion, does that mean we can forget about it altogether, or does it have some subsidiary role? So who favours happiness? Um, well, the classical, it just started with the, well, it didn't start with the classical utilitarians. It, it started with Aristotle, probably, or probably before that as we know with Aristotle. Uh, but the classical utilitarians uh, have been, in, in relatively modern times, the most important uh, initiators of this approach. And uh, in, even in the US Constitution, there is the idea that one of the goals of objective, not the only one, but one, is the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Note, actually, that it's the pursuit of happiness. It's not the achievement of happiness. And, the, and these two could be quite distinct. Um, but as I'm sure everybody knows, Jeremy Bentham, again, following a huge succession of people, he wasn't even the person who invented the, uh, the, the phrase, the greatest happiness is the greatest number, but we always attribute it to him. He argued very strongly that it, happiness should be taken as our guide to morality as well as policy making. So doing good is increasing people's happiness and doing bad is decreasing people's happiness. It's the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. And sometimes he says what the society should aim for is the greatest total sum of happiness, which incidentally, of course, we should note, can you add it up? And he's, he's assuming you can. And he has indeed something called a felicific, felicific calculus in which he argues that you can add up happiness in various ways. And the approach was taken up but with some qualifications by John Stuart Mill. And following John Stuart Mill and a uh, number of economists, Edgeworth, Marshall, and so on, used this utilitarian approach, which was maximizing utility and interpretation of happiness, as the justification and basis of measurement of national income. Because they are, as everybody knows, who's you know, in economics 101, that's the... Um, Basis, marginal utility is the basis of uh, measuring national income, and the idea is national income is a measure of societal happiness interpreted as societal um, utility. Now, when it first started, there were strongly uh, egalitarian implications from this, particularly brought up by Pigou, but also by others, but the, the basic point in economics that you have diminishing marginal utility if you consume more and more of one thing could be applied to income as a whole, and so as you consume more of it, you get diminishing marginal utility. If you want to maximize utility, you would have, broadly speaking, an egalitarian distribution, and, and people was a very strong egalitarian. And um, we all know that equality is a very political thing, it's not just a technical issue. And so, of course, people found reasons why this 
approach was wrong. And in particular, Lionel Robbins um, argued, uh, as I'll come to in a minute, that you couldn't make interpersonal comparisons, and therefore the fact that you would like to maximise each person's utility was okay, but you couldn't add them all up and say, because of diminishing marginal utility, we should have equality. Um, and now, nonetheless, as of course, again, is very familiar, the income approach, which was based on the original utility approach, was criticised for many reasons. One was the distributional issue, but also many market failures, externalities, problems of interpersonal interactions, and the fact that it leaves out a whole lot of other objectives of human life, which are also important. So, gross national product came to be seen as a rather imperfect measure of progress. And yet, despite that, and despite very, very strong reasons against using it as the main criterion of progress, that is how it's used. So, to go back to the Neil Ferguson article, he wrongly says that GMP growth rate has been higher than other countries. That's false. Um, but he regards that as a big achievement. And so does the IMF, and so does everyone else when they're assessing countries' progress. So it remains, despite a lot of attacks, it remains a, a critical way of assessing progress. Well, who favours happiness? I talked about the old utilitarians. Now we have a modern set who I'll call the neo-utilitarians. Um, now, they're very different from the old ones. The old ones used utility to justify the use of income. These new ones use happiness as a critique of income. So it's really sort of the opposite way around. And we, we have Easterlin, Kahneman, Layard, Graham, a whole lot of people. I should be using Layard a lot because he puts the case for happiness so strongly. He's a sort of good... It's easy to attack him, whereas some of the others are a little bit more moderate. <laughs> and also, and he, he writes very clearly, so I should use him a lot. Um, there's the Sarkozy Commission, the commission which was set up um, in order to assess um, progress by President Sarkozy. And they also have happiness, though it's a sort of weird report if you ever read it, because they've got capability. They had three people doing it. One of them was Amartya Sen, so he argued for capabilities. There was a happiness guru, and so he argued for happiness. And the third one argued for the environment. So you have, at the end of the day, a report saying we should look at these three things and no way of weighting them at all. Those, those, those are the three things which are important. Then you have, uh, which is quite famous, you have Bhutan, a small, very small country, which actually says they've given up gross national product. And instead of gross national product, they have something called gross national happiness and it's often cited. And it's obviously um, it's sort of exciting that one country's actually gone as far as that. Now, most of the happiness gurus argue for, a, um, argue for happiness as one of the objectives, not the only one. But Layard is, I think, perhaps one of the few who says it should be the only metric, the exclusive objective, and anything else is instrumental. So let me come to him. He says, it is thus self-evident that the best society is the happiness. So that's actually his reasoning. I mean, one comes to think of it, it seems to me that when you say something is self-evident, it's equivalent to saying I don't have any arguments for it, but I know it's right. <laughs> so this is what it is. Um, um, and he says it's self-evident because happiness is an objective dimension of all our experience, <coughs> and we are programmed to seek happiness. Happiness is supremely important because it's our overall motivational device. Which is a weird thing, because supposing our over overall motivational device, as it is for some people, is jealousy or hatred. Should we say, oh, because it's our overall motivational advice, uh, device, this is what we should pursue. And you, I mean, it really is a very strong way of getting an ought from an is and an incorrect one, I think. <coughs> um, and as obviously, there are many other overall motivational uh, things, and I think above all, for humans, it's survival. It's in a Darwinian sense, much more important than pursuit of happiness. So, anyway, it's a bad argument, but it's a, not only a bad argument, but it's an incorrect argument. Well, as I said, the source of this neo-utilitarianism is a distrust of conventional economic assessments, 
And empirically, it's been found that GMP per capita is not all that correlated with happiness, so they are saying something important. I mean, if it was correlated perfectly, obviously, there wouldn't be much point in moving to a happiness device, so <coughs> fine, we've already encompassed it. Um, there's a particular issue that people, when, when they're saying whether they're happy, compare themselves to a reference group. And if their reference group goes up at the same rate as them, then they may not actually get any better at all. They're on a treadmill, what's known as the hedonic treadmill. If inequality is increasing, the reference group might actually go up in relation to them, and they may actually get worse off as growth happens. Um, <coughs> so that's a big reason. Um, and then, of course, GMP doesn't consider many, many non-economic sources of happiness. That's another reason why the happiness isn't correlated with GMP. Um, well, let me turn to a few alternative approaches. One is capability and human rights approach, and they share the initial <coughs> criticism of GMP. Indeed, Amartya Sen was, has been a leading crit critic and a leading theoretical critic of <coughs> GMP. He's not just pointing out it's not correlated with this, that, and the other, but he says it's incorrect, because uh, partly because we have plural objectives. There are many other things uh, that matter to people and it's very narrow, very reductionist, and partly because it, you know, if, you, if you think about marginal utility, your utility depends on what other people are doing, and your choices often depend on what other people are doing, and we interpret marginal utility as if it just reflects your own preferences and well-being, whereas in fact what other people will be doing also affects it. And of course he also says that very important it's not only outcomes that are important, but how we get there. So he has, um, uh, for example, I mean, in income is basically an outcome, and happiness is an outcome too. Um, but there might be some things we think it just, yes, you might maximize your happiness, but you, in order to do that, you have to tread on other people, you have to do, you know, abuse things. In, now you, you might abuse the environment and so on and so forth. There are many other things ways you get there, and, and you have to worry about process as well as about what happens in the end. Um, at its most extreme, some people say, well, the, the best way of meeting people's basic needs, say, or the best way of maybe even, well, not happiness, but basic needs, this is more in a prison, people are very well treated, they get their needs met, and so on and so forth, but the context is very unsatisfactory. Um, so that so Amartya Sen then criticizes GMP for all those different reasons and argues very strongly that we should be pluralistic in our approach to assessing progress. In other words, there isn't going to be one single dimension which we say this is what determines progress, but rather there are a whole lot of different things and we can look at them all and assess them. So if you like to put it rather simply, there's a dashboard and you're looking, at, I mean, Marty Sen talks about freedoms. You look at your political freedoms and your security and your social life and all those different things which matter. Um, he avoids talking about waiting and he avoids actually defining what people should do. He feels each person should choose for themselves and so on and so forth. But he's definitely pluralistic. And I think there's a big, a big distinction between those people who think there is going to be a single objective, whether it's GMP or happiness, and those people who feel which I'm one of them, that there are many objectives and you're never going to be able to find a single objective which is going to be overriding. However, Layard is totally opposed to pluralism. He says we, one of the reasons to go for happiness is we've got to have a single objective and this is the best one to choose because if we have to have a single objective then this is the best one to choose. The all-encompassing objective. Um, but that, uh, right from the start, makes the assumption that we have to have only one objective instead of, as everybody is in their everyday life, they have many objectives and they weigh them up and make decisions. So it is for societies, there isn't a single objective. Now let me come to the meaning of the happiness objective, because so far I have just talked about it as if we understand what it means. Um, and it's really been, uh, really what it means, how we interpret what it means is going to determine what it means, so to speak, because some senses of happiness lead us in one direction and some lead us in another. 
Well, if you could turn to Carol Graham, who's written a lot, she calls it, happiness is subjective well-being. Layard, feeling good, enjoying life. What matters ultimately is what people feel. Um, and he finds that happiness can vary over time, the time of day, and over the state of life. That's a very general finding, that it varies over the state of life. <coughs> it tends to be, it goes in a U shape. It tends to be um, okay when you're young, as you approach middle age, it gets worse, as you approach old age, it gets better. So that's good for people to cheer them up if you're in the middle, <laughs> if you're in the middle years. Um, given that it varies over time and over the stage of life, Layard then says, well, you obviously have to deal with this because it's an issue. When you did a survey, you wouldn't know. If you, if you do it in the morning, you're going to get different results from if you do it in the evening and so on. I'll show you a, a curve in a minute. And then if you do it for young people, you get different results. And if the age composition of your society is changing, your happiness will change just because of that. Um, and for no other reason. So in order to get over that, he says, what we should be aiming for is long-term average happiness over your whole life, which obviously is an absurd thing because you couldn't possibly measure it. I mean, who do, how do you know? You know, so it's, it's, he gets out of it, but gets himself into more, more problems. This is the curve showing, which is in his book, how your happiness varies over the time of day, which I think is quite funny. <laughs> it's quite low at the, uh, when you, uh, in the morning, and it sort of rises. It always peaks every time you have a meal, I think, because at lunchtime it gets up. <laughs> and, maybe, and then it goes down again in the afternoon. And, every, and then you're absolutely thrilled. You're about to give it all up and go to bed, and it goes up quite high. So let me say how other people have... have um, to find happiness. Now, Aristotle and eudaimonia is very important, very different sort of happiness. Uh, and, and many people would say it's not really happiness at all, it's a flourishing life. And that approach is much more akin to the capabilities approach, particularly both of Martha Nussbaum and of Amartya Sen. Fulfillment of human potential, having a range of things, very, very different from this happiness which moves over time. Uh, John Stuart Mill says you can distinguish different kinds of pleasure. Some are more valuable and desirable than others. Um, poetry is better than um, pushpin. Pushpin sort of uh, some sort of game like bagatelle, I think. Um, so you know that's a bit snobbish. You know, you're elitist, uh, and therefore you it's sort of getting on to the saying that some people, more educated people, can get more pleasure, better types of pleasure than others. <laughs> Well, psychologists have differentiated between what they call affective or emotional component of happiness and the cognitive or judgmental component. And that's quite important in terms of measurement, and I'll come to, I'll come to that in a minute. Then Kenny and Kenny, they have put in three components, not just two, contentment, welfare, and dignity. I mean, that really gets us so far away from an intuitive interpretation of happiness. That, I mean, just moving into something else. Maybe contentment is approaching the, uh, our original idea of happiness. But welfare, well, we're now getting probably into some sort of basic needs type of assessment. And dignity, dignity is a very important aspect of life. Um, and some people have argued that should be the overriding objective even. <coughs> but it's not the same as happiness. Um, so we have a whole lot of different ways of measuring, uh, of uh, defining it. And then when it comes to measures, you can obviously therefore get a whole lot of different measures. So these are the questions they generally ask when they try and assess happiness. Did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? I must say, you have to have good memory to remember if you smiled or laughed yesterday. <laughs> um, generally speaking, how happy are you with your life? That's, that's uh, you don't have, you can make an assessment. That's a little, generally speaking, how satisfied are you with your life? So we're now moving away from happy to satisfac being satisfied. Imagine a ladder from 0 to 10 with 10 the best possible life. On which step do you stand? Now, the point is some of them are much closer to what the psychology is called effective emotional measures, and some of them are more close to the cognitive assessments. And if you, uh, you correlate them across, there's really quite weak correlation between the two. Even between, between two and three, generally speaking, how happy are you with your life? And then how satisfied are you 
with your life, even that gets quite different answers. So we're beginning to see that it's a very murky field if we were going to make happiness our main objective. Then we come to distributional issues. Um, you know, if you're maximizing, as I said, total societal or global happiness, it means you're adding up happiness across <coughs> individuals in determining that, and you want to maximize it, because you would distribute your resources to maximize it. Well, Robbins said, you can't make these comparisons, these interpersonal comparisons. He was then refuting Pigurin and the, the egalitarian philosophy. And he said, and I love this because it sort of shows how in the 30s the sort of evidence economists were allowed to produce. <laughs> in our hearts, we do not regard different men's satisfaction from similar means as equally valuable. So all, do away with all that sample and stuff like that. You just have to look at your heart and, and you know what, what the answer is. And notice that it's different men, because he doesn't worry about women at all. <laughs> and notice also, because this is another of my topics, which I'm not talking about today, but I'm very into group inequality, or what I call horizontal inequality, racial inequality, and so on. Imagine that same statement, but with a race in our hearts. We do not regard different races' satisfaction from similar means as equally valuable. I mean, it's a, a totally, well, a certainly politically incorrect, and totally incorrect statement. You know, it's just a, a weird thing. But the really weird thing about this statement is its devastating effect on the economics profession. Because from that day, economists accepted that you couldn't make interpersonal comparisons and the utility was ordinal, not cardinal. And the result was that economists were neutral on income distribution, except for instrumental reasons, you know, efficiency reasons, and so on, like that, so on. So it is amazing that that statement should have been so powerful. So now the neo-utilitarians come in, and they say that, actually, they say comparisons are possible, uh, and they do argue that you should choose a distribution that will maximize total happiness, but it, it's still very unclear how they argue that, because we, supposing you've got your one to 10 ladder, you are implicitly assuming that you know the people who say nine and who are very poor, or people who say seven, that you, you can add them up, and it really, it really is unconvincing. Um, on the other hand, what you can do, and what, what the happiness people have done, is to look at different distributions, say they've done it across Latin America, where different countries have different distributions, and look at the happiness of different groups, and compare those and say, look, are more equal societies getting, on average, better marks than the less equal, and so on. Uh, and the evidence is really a little bit unclear. On, on the one hand, as you might expect, poor people don't get much happiness from inequality. On the other hand, rich people get quite a lot of happiness from inequality. So you're back to having to wait those rich and poor people to decide what to do with that, those answers. If you weight them equally, then you would leave your distribution, because Anything you take away from the rich is going to cause them so much unhappiness that you might as well, you better leave it. So unless you have some independent reason for thinking one distribution is better than another, you're back to way of being, uh, not knowing um, what to do. So it doesn't really help on the distributional front. Uh, so here I've just uh, said what has been found. In the US and Europe, inequality has modest or no effects on happiness. Um, and there's also evidence which is plausible that people value losses more than they value gains, which of course is bad for redistribution because it, you're involved in losses and gains and if they value the losses more, it's not going to be good for them. So what about um, the other fundamental goals to development? I've already talked quite a bit about capabilities and freedom. Human rights approach, people have universal rights um, to certain fundamental aspects of development. And, and these, these human rights, of course, they vary according to uh, who, is, who and when the rights were defined. I already quoted the US Constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, then we have the United Nations set of human rights, agreed initially in 1948 and um, interpreted as the time, time goes on. So there are rights to all sorts of specific things. And they've got a sort of particular legitimacy because particular governments have actually signed up to them. So they're also a political agenda, not just a philosophical agenda. Uh, and basically, they normally cover health, nutrition, education, political freedoms, security. 
And then we have capabilities and freedoms, the, the, the approach of Amartya Sen, and that development consists of the expansion of capabilities which people have reason to value. Um, I'm not here to do a critique of capabilities. In fact, I'm going to be on the whole sort of supporting it. But there is a problem about this phrase which is always slipped in. People have reason to value it. So why do they have reason to value it? And, and why are some things you have reason to value and other things you don't have reason to value? Um, then, as I said, agency is fundamental. And then there's the issue of justice, which is really independent of all these approaches. What is a just distribution? What does a just distribution look like? What is it across individuals, across groups, across societies? Um, which would look at both capabilities and freedoms and human rights and indeed happiness. Or any of these needs to be overlaid with a sense of what is a just society. So we have a series of alternative fundamental goals which we might wish to pursue. Now, according to the happiness approach, all the other goals are instrumental. Um, and here I quote from layout again, goods like health, autonomy and freedom are instrumental goods. It's an amazing statement because if you were happy and very ill, that's fine, or happy and no freedom, that's fine, and so on and so forth. Well, the capability, um, uh, and, uh, I mean, his approach implies that you can violate human rights if it maximizes total happiness, and you value particular capabilities only if you, only if um, they advance happiness. And I quote here from Ernest Hemingway, happiness in intelligent people is the rarest thing I know. <laughs> I'm not sure he's right or not, but if he's right, it would imply that, um, yeah, that's a big handicap possibly for education and certainly for so agency would only be valued if it increased happiness. Justice would be viewed instrumentally. And so we come to the point which has uh, become the title of set, uh, quite a few articles. You can be a happy peasant or a happy slave. <coughs> and the, the happiness approach would say that's fine. Um, well, what about the empirical evidence of relationships between happiness and other girls? If you look at the correlation across all countries, and this is being a very gross thing because you're adding up happiness for the whole society and then you're comparing GDP and HDI, Human Development Index. Human Development Index is a broad, a very crude measure of capabilities of human development, consisting of education, a measure of education, a measure of health, and some income is in there. But an income which is discounted according to how rich the society is. Well, anyway, looking at these correlations, you can see that um, satisfaction, life satisfaction, it's not, the, it's not the how, 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 how much did you laugh yesterday, but more how satisfied are you with your life overall, um, all have reasonably high correlations with, um, with these other objectives. Uh, the, the one that does best is life expectancy, followed by more or less, more or less the same human development index. Income does worst, average years of schooling is, is in between. But those are for all, com all countries. Now, if you differentiate countries according to their level of development, you find the correlation really disappears for the bottom levels. So it remains pretty high at the very high human development countries. But for the countries I'm particularly interested in, which is poorer countries, even high human development countries, and these are categorized, categorized fairly arbitrary by the UNDP, has no correlation. Medium, a little bit more. Low human development, very low. So essentially, we are talking about as I, something different. We're not just talking about, um, it's not the case that if you have high human development, you have high happiness. If you have low, you have low happiness. And this is a scatter across of human development index <laughs> and life satisfaction across all countries. And I've just labeled the ones that are remarkable in being very high or very low. Uh, so the, the ones that are very high get a lot of life satisfaction out of um, not such good human development index. So you find Denmark does very well, Costa Rica does very well, Dominican Republic, Malawi, down at the bottom, Togo, Iraq, Botswana, 
Bulgaria, Latvia, uh, for what it's worth. But you, from the correlation, you can see the point that I was making, that when you divide up countries according to their level of human development, you can see almost no correlation. When you take the whole thing as a whole, it looks like there's a good correlation. Now, a major problem for happiness as, as an objective is that people adapt to their circumstances. Um, and uh, here's a quote from Carol Graham. There's evidence of a great deal of upward and downward adaptation as well as a clear role for innate character traits in determining the relationship between happiness and various other variables. So, um, some research shows that you adapt, you tend to adopt the local reference group when you determine your happiness, both in developing and developed countries. Some research shows that unemployed people are happier when the overall unemployment rate is high. Well, it makes sense. You know, you feel less it's an individual curse and more it's a societal one. Um, in Russia, even in Russia, <laughs> employed people are happier if the unemployment rate is high <laughs> because they get sort of, they feel, oh, I've got the one job, you know. Um, and then unhappiness from unemployment, and this is a real sign of adaptation, diminishes as the unemployment persists. So the longer you're unemployed, the less it creates unhappiness. Which is good that people adapt to their circumstances. I mean, if they didn't, life would be very difficult. And it makes life less difficult. But it does make happiness not a very good indicator of what people's situation is. And here's some more examples of this. Um, local health norms are important. So poor people famously report less ill health than richer people. If you actually do reported health on a set of people and ask them, you find that the richer the people, the more they're reporting ill health. I suppose because they don't have facilities to go to if they have have ill health and they're used to being ill in some way or another. Um, where the crime norm is higher, where there's more crime, crime has a less negative impact on people. And the same is true with corruption. If there's a lot of corruption in society, that seems to have a less negative effect on happiness than if there's only a little, and then people really sit up and notice it and get unhappy. Here is some, just for interest, some correlates with happiness across individuals in a number of different, uh, summarizing a number of different pieces of research. And the few things that come out of that um, is that um, it's interesting. Sometimes being male is negative and sometimes it's positive. It depends where you are. Um, but unemployment is universally negative um, and health is universally positive, which I think we would have intuitively thought that would be the case. And the other things vary a lot according to where you are. In any case, correlation is not causation, as we all know. And you could argue that happier people tend to have better health. There's a lot of evidence of that. So maybe, and I think I would accept this, that happiness should be instrumental, the opposite of the layout position. In order to get better health, we should try and be more happy. Um, people who are happier tend to be and stay married, and there's more there's correlation with marriage and, and happiness. They tend to live longer, so therefore they're more likely to be retired, and there's a correlation between being retired and happiness, and so on. So uh, well, you can't tell much from those correlations. Now, another problem for development policy is that there are a huge number of things which explain happiness outside development policy. And, I mean, that's good, that's uh, fine, but it does mean that as a guide to development policy, it's not going to be very good, because there's going to be a lot of noise in that. For example, genetics explain up to about half a person's happiness, temperament, upbringing, age, marriage, religion, and various events, which may be positive <coughs> or negative, but have nothing to do with development, various personal events. They all are hugely important. They're not affected by development policy. Then there are things which are indirectly affected by development policy, but pretty indirectly, like how people behave, their, how much exercise they take, their nutrition, their friendships, their narcotics, and so on and so forth. Um, then there's the um, social context. What sort of social institutions are they? Do people have, are they in a nice community? And so on and so forth. The local environment, the political context, the security, all these things, of course, are indirectly influenced by development policy, but they're not things that we can affect on a day-by-day <coughs> -day basis. 
And then there are some things which are central to development policy, uh, economic circumstances, health and education, but it's just one of the, just a small element of the total explanation. So even if we accepted the whole thing, it would be a very weak um, way of guiding policy because of all that noise that's going on and we'd have to take out the noise to see what was happening. Um, then I want to come to the point that if we did take happiness seriously, we could have some adverse potential policy implications. And I got some of this material from uh, a historian at Queen Elizabeth House called Nandini Guptu, who's been working on very poor people in India. Um, that you could decide to promote adaptation to bad circumstances rather than changing the circumstances. Indeed, it might be cheaper. And she reported that there's a Stanford University and Harvard Kennedy School stress reduction lab. And they actually explicitly says, given how difficult it is politically to reduce poverty, the lab has been established to reduce negative effects of poverty among those experiencing it, notably stress. So, all right, we leave you with our income malnourished and poorly educated, but you'll feel a bit better about it. <laughs> And there are, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence of serious mental health problems among the poor in India, and that is a sign of how uh, um, poverty does negatively affect all these things. But there is a temptation, therefore, to introduce a lot of mental health policies. It's not only a, a temptation, it is being done actively by some aid agencies. Um, I'm not saying rather than attacking poverty, but it, the, the result, there is a choice in that where they put the resources. Um, so policies, the other problem is that policies which worsen objective conditions might actually raise happiness. So you could worsen the conditions of the reference group and then everybody else would be better off. And, and I suppose that's well known as the politics of envy and we're supposed to practice it all the time. But uh, then there's a question that, you know, people are happier when there's more unemployment. So in Russia you would put the unemployment rate up and get people happy and so on and so forth. So um, there are all sorts of ways in which policies which actually worsen things might raise happiness. And I finally, I come to a, a, a what I call the goat policy, which is a story that um, my family used to tell a lot. And it's a story, it's a Jewish story about um, a rabbi and a family who goes, who's got a family is large and in a very small house, and they go to the rabbi and say, what shall we do? You know, I just can't bear it. There's all the children are there, and my aunt and my uncle. And the rabbi says, invite the neighbors in. So he invites the neighbors in, and then he goes back to the rabbi, it's got worse, it's terrible. So then he says, well, I think you should um, bring your chickens and your hens and things in. So he brings the chickens and hens, and so it goes on. Finally, he says, you should bring your goat in. So he brings the goat in, and he goes back to the rabbi and says, you know, this is ridiculous, it's terrible. All right, said the rabbi, let the goat leave. So the goat is left out of the house, he goes back to the rabbi, that's wonderful. We've got so much room now. <laughs> so there is sort of temptation that you can sort of falsely raise happiness in that way. Um, then there are policies which you improve the objective conditions, but you reduce the happiness. Um, more rapid growth can raise expectations faster than income. Spread of health entitlements can raise expectations more than fulfillment, or just raise a feeling of dissatisfaction with people's health, and so on. And then I've talked about policies uh, to encourage adaptation to bad conditions. There are also problems that may be neglected if we just look at happiness. One very serious problem, and this is a real problem that I think we've got to think about much more seriously than we ever have, is how to bring future generations into our thinking about what the current objectives should be and our current decisions. And that is shown up very acutely with the happiness, because obviously when you, say, you survey people's happiness, it's people who are alive today. Um, and how are you going, what are, you, what, what are we doing about those people who are not alive today? I mean, that's a very serious problem, we know, for income and so on, but we've got various ways of discounting for that. But for the happiness, it's a really critical problem. And then who speaks for the people who can't be surveyed? So infants and small children, those with acute mental problems, Martha Nussbaum would include the animal kingdom, maybe we should, but there are a lot of people who can't be surveyed and whose voices will not be heard if we look at 
look at happiness. So, in summary, happiness shouldn't displace, in my view, our major approaches of human rights, capabilities and freedoms, justice. And these major approaches are not instrumental to happiness, but they are fund fundamental objectives. Um, so, I won't think of What is the positive contribution of the new happiness literature? I think there is a positive contribution. I think the positive contribution is its questioning of the growth treadmill. And I think that's becoming increasingly important given the environmental constraints, which really mean that we should not be on this growth treadmill. And not only does the growth treadmill lead to huge environmental issues, but also it's not even increasing happiness. So it really is, a, I think it's very useful. And then I think Richard Layard in, in person has made a big difference to the attitudes towards mental health and mental health services in this country which I, I don't, I haven't, I'm not a big expert, but I think have become better under his influence. He's been taken very seriously. So clearly, they, there's some positive contribution. Well, I finally want to ask the question, does that mean we're going to throw happiness out of the window or not? Um, I think the first point to make is that you wouldn't want to make decisions about development that actually seriously increase on the happiness. So I think that I'm, I'm against happiness, so to speak, but I'm not in favor of misery. I'm against misery. So you do need to look out, and I think it's a sort of um, good uh, sign, a sort of, if, if people are made seriously unhappy by some development policy, you should take it seriously. You shouldn't just say, oh, well, you ought to be happy. You've got a lovely new house. So happens, of course, we've taken you away from your old community, we've destroyed your culture and all those things, but look at your habit, look at your nutrition, look at that. We should take it seriously if, they become, if people become unhappy or if they express unhappiness. And it's a way of being more participatory. So it should be one way in which we look at change, but not the only way. Um, and not necessarily the decisive way, but I, I may be decisive if it's a question of seriously worsening, serious misery a misery index, uh, not a decisive if it's a question of uh, short-term happiness. So, in conclusion, happiness should not displace other development goals, but it's not totally irrelevant to decision-making. Um, and for the capability approach, the impact on happiness and its distribution may be relevant to assessing policy, mm -hmm. but it's not decisive, it's just one factor added to the dashboard. And I would finally note that um, Bhutan's national happiness measure, you know, I started by saying Bhutan has got national, gross national happiness as its objective. If you actually read what they include in that, it's quite interesting because it has um, nine different domains, and the domains are basically very capability oriented, like education, health and so on, and only one of them is subjective happiness. So although it calls it gross national happiness, basically it's a, a weighted index. I mean, how they weight it is, of course, arbitrary. And just to go, come back to Aristotle, I, he may be thought of as the foundation, the foundational as far as happiness is concerned, but really interpreting him, he's much more foundational with respect to capabilities than happiness. Thank you. <coughs>